mysterywire.com home of the unusual and unknown from area 51 to the paranormal it's your source to the most vetted ufo stories and special investigations in the world take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com well hi everybody welcome to another edition of the mystery wire podcast glad to have you with us here today and we got a large cast here for it's happy birthday time okay we, we could do cake we could do ice cream we could do all sorts of celebrating here but it was a year ago this week that Mystery Wire was launched. So, set up the table here. One of the original, well, the original producer and writer, Greg Haas, is with us here at the far end of the table, along with Duncan Phoenix, who is the producer now and writes Hello. a lot of the stuff. There, welcome. Matt Adams, chief journalist here, at uh, chief uh, photojournalist at 8 News Now, and has been the, the, the photographer all time, the photojournalist all time with George for years and years, covering many of the things with... Mystery Wire, and of course, needs no introduction, George Knapp, the king, king of all media, and I know Howard Stern tried to take that. Emperor. Title. Emperor is good. We'll go Emperor, okay. And uh, I'm Ron Futrell, the guy without the mask. And we're, we have social distance here <laughs> a little bit, so we, we do have some, some distance from everybody here, so we want to make it safe here during the coronavirus stuff. But George, let's jump it over to you. And it, was, it has been a fast year year let's go there you say that all the time i know that but but it's been a pretty quick year that we a lot of work putting this thing together with mystery wire and now you take a deep breath and go wow it's made a lot of progress yeah 2020 is a blur for all for many of us for a variety of reasons but especially here at mystery wire we had uh we had started the conversation maybe three years ago chris berg who's a vice president with next star terry foley lisa uh howfield our station manager to see all this gigantic pile of information, stories, interviews, so much of it rare, one-of-a-kind uh, material that we've accumulated over the last 30-plus years in this unique niche. And, you know, as we've talked about before on the program, all roads lead to Las Vegas in news. It is especially true in the UFO paranormal field. That, that who, know, who knew there would be a place called Area 51? I, I didn't when I moved here. And then Nellis Air Force Base and people like Bob Bigelow and Harry Reid and uh, people important people who are movers and shakers in the field who are here. So that provides a lot of stories without us ever leaving our hometown. But uh, Matt and I have traveled all over the country, all over the world, uh, chasing down bits and pieces of information. So about three years ago, we started talking about the creation of a website where maybe we could bring this uh, material to the rest of the world. Most of it aired only once on KLAS. And unless somebody had a VHS ru running at the time, it's, uh, it's been locked in our archives. So the idea was to not only open up the archi archival material, but to produce new content, and that's what we've been doing. Um, so we started, I don't know, in earnest, probably two years ago. And, uh, you know, Ron, I think you <laughs> will remember what it was like, because you were involved, uh, both you and Greg were involved in the accumulation of the database. Matt and I would try to remember which stories we did when and made this master list of what could fall under the umbrella of the mystery wire, which, by the way, I think that name was your idea, wasn't it? I, I would like to take credit for that. I did. I, well, and I will take I will take credit for it, okay, because I here, – and here's – the process went – I just took – I just went to the, the, the thesaurus. Did I say that right? Is that how you say yeah. that thing? That thing again? Yeah, okay. We'll look uh, it up. We'll look it up and see it. what it – I went to the thesaurus and just started matching words that had to do with the paranormal and words that had to do with media and reporting. And so I came up with five or six of them, I emailed it to you and emailed it out, and then found out that Mystery Wire had, uh, th th there was no, had th the website had not been taken, uh, and, and trademark had not been taken, and that, and oh, all the social media stuff. So then said, okay, see what you can all think, and you spotted it as one that you liked. And it just went from there. Someday we'll have to do a story about the names that didn't make the cut. You know, the other ones <laughs> in the top ten. They're, they're on my email somewhere. We've got a few of them. But once we got the green light to go ahead and start putting it together, then the process was to put what together. And we cast a pretty wide net in terms of the stories and interviews we'd already done. And uh, Matt and I put together sort of the master list and then dove into the files. And then you two guys... Uh, took it from there to start not only gathering them up and putting them in a central place, but sort of going through the content, noting who appears in what story, what the date was when it aired. Talk about that process, Ron, then we'll hear from Greg. Yeah, that, that became a fishing expedition for me, a very fun fishing expedition, because that was when Terry Foley, news director here, called me. I was at home. I remember he called me at home and said, hey, Ron, you're sitting down. i got a project for you. I said, okay, well, what's, what's next? I've been doing sports, been doing news over the years, and a number of different things. 
And she says, well, Nexstar wants to put together this website of collection of Georgia stuff. And having been in this market now for 36 years, working at the competition, now working at Channel 8, I had seen your stuff. So I, I had a, a pretty good knowledge of what you had done in this market and, and what we had succeeded with and what had, had been done. Then it became a fishing expedition with Matt's help, with your help, of going through a number of different things. Oh, there, there's the files, uh, bringing them in here, <laughs> of all the books, and then writing down what we had. And, and I found I'd always had reverence, and I, I don't use that word lightly. I'd always had reverence for what you had done as a, as a journalist in this market. And so to me, it was an absolute pleasure than to start going through that stuff and finding all that old stuff and, and remember, oh, I remember that story. I me- oh, I remember this story. I remember that story. So I had a, a bit of a memory with some of the stuff. And, that, and th- then it was just fun just to compile it, put it all together, and you see as Duncan brought these big, then record them all and put them down. I, I had to assign importance to them. And that was sort of tough to go, which because I wanted to put a five on all of them, one through five, importance. Oh, that's pretty good. Oh, that's pretty good. And, and had to at some point go, ah, there's a four and a two and a, and a one. But, but most of them came out to be fives because I was biased. And that's what we came up with. And then Greg comes on board and, and takes all this stuff and puts it into, a way, into something that's legible on the Internet. And also visible for people to see. Yeah, you know, people assume that it's all about UFOs, and of course, we have a much broader uh, umbrella mm-hmm. of stories that we include under the Mystery Wire banner. Greg, you you come from a newspaper background. I know from years of being had my head kicked in by newspaper critics uh, how the general print media views my interest in these topics. Um, I, I won't put you on the spot and ask you if you had the same, but it is a learning curve to get your head around some of this stuff, right? It is, and yeah, print media people are pretty tough. They they always want to be seen as uh, the experts, the authority, and hey, I came to town a couple of months after Ned Day died, and there's, there's so much I've learned about the crossover between what Channel 8 does, what newspapers did, and what readers love. Uh, I remember when we first started going through the books and picking out stories to work on, it seems like Cuejo was one of my first mm. stories I worked on. And there's, there's just so much uh, history and uh, you know topics like the Needles UFO that we, we worked on pretty hard. And this stuff is really interesting. And uh, I, I think that reverence is a good word. Um, what I came to appreciate when I came here and started working with you guys was you know, the serious treatment you were giving it. And yeah, you can call something a UFO. We're not saying it's a flying saucer. It's a report of a UFO. Make the distinction. Uh, there's, there's very much uh, attention towards paranormal topics and, and uh, wild stories and yeah, the people I worked with early on, they they took a dim view of it, but you cornered it, and hats off to you for that. As I go back and I, I talk to people I worked with years ago, they say, oh, you, you work with George now, and they have a lot of good things to say. And Duncan, then you came in later, yeah. but you had a, a steep learning curve yourself to get your head around this Absolutely. Stuff. I came in uh, mid-February of this year. Um, who would have thought this year would have been this year? Um, the way it turned out, um, which let alone I was in the, the newsroom here where we produced Mystery Wire for about a month, and then we all went home for months, and uh, steep learning curve. Not only with that, with the topic, um, <clears throat> I'm getting there. Uh, learning all the names is one thing. Learning all the acronyms is another thing. <laughs> um, and then learning how they all connect. And like you said, the, the, you know, nine times out of ten, there's a connection right through Las Vegas. It's, it's a hub for this. Matt, you and I, uh, the challenge is uh, the older we get, well, at least for me, the fuzzier my memory gets, but um, going through the files and the things that uh, Greg and, and, uh, and Ron would dig up, oh, yeah, that's right. Remember that one? It really rekindled a lot of memories for us, but there's some great stories that we've produced over the years that we forgot about. Yeah, there's, there's a lot in there. And go back and you look at all the work that we put into it, I mean... We would spend days and days on the road and uh, chasing these things down. And then also just to look at the big picture, you look back at them all and everything's 
got a connection, like especially a lot of the UFO and paranormal stuff, like who knew throughout the years that this could all culminate into such a huge connection like it has. So yeah, it's been interesting to go back and uh, I'm kind of happy with some of those stories looking back on them. I know at the time I was probably like, ah, oh, sweating buckets, just <laughs> trying to get them on the air. But and what am I going to fill this yeah. video with? <laughs> <laughs> but now looking back there, there's a lot of great stuff there. Um, I shot a little cell phone video of the day that we signed on, uh, November 6th, and uh, here sitting in this same room, and there's, a, there's, there's Matt and Ron staring at their screens, and we flip it around, and uh, the lady to my uh, left is Lisa Halfield, our station general manager, and Terry Foley on the other side, and way down there is Greg, and that was quite a tense moment. I mean, we had worked and worked <laughs> and worked to get that thing on the air and then flip the switch, and there it was live. Um, Duncan, I mean, what are some of the highlights of the first year? You're the guy who looks at all the numbers of the views and what right. the public really responded to. So, so far uh, in, the, in the year plus a day or two that uh, Mystery Wire has been around, um, we're not going to get into exact numbers, but uh, millions of people, millions of page views, uh, millions of videos that have been watched, um, tons of, uh, of views of the, the long-form interviews. George, you've done you know, just dozens of interviews that only little, you know, maybe five, ten second snippets hit the air once. Well, we've got the whole half hour interview and we've been trying to work to get some of those out uh, in the long unedited form. Now, as far as what's been the biggest hit on Mystery Wire, you know, you might think uh, Area 51, UFOs. You're not wrong, you're just not right. So according <laughs> to our numbers, or according to our, our back-end stuff that we look at, um, I'm going to go through a couple of these, and you guys can tell me about this story if you remember it, which I think you will. The first story that I can find that was actually written for Mystery Wire, the website, was on the Clown Motel in Tonopah that was for sale at the time. Now, if anyone knows Nevada and has done any searching online about strange things in Nevada, you probably have come across the Clown Motel. Uh, tell us a little bit about that one. Uh, this was not a story that I wrote, but it's one that Matt and I have wanted to do for a long time. And uh, have avoided. Yes. We, have <laughs> avoided. <laughs> we, yeah. we, we were looking at the Clown Motel before Instagram came around. We, yes. That place has actually gotten less creepy than it was when it was originally uh, discovered by us. And it's right next to a cemetery. Yeah, yeah right cemetery next to a cemetery. Clowns. Um, it is creepy. It's genuinely creepy. It's in Tonopah, and we've stayed there dozens of times on all kinds of different kinds of stories, uh, but we never stayed at the Creepy Clown Motel. <laughs> uh, we've uh, managed to, doggone it, somebody always books it somewhere else. But that was, uh, that was one that was written and uh, popped up on Mystery Wire in the early going. And you see it now, it comes back up. Somebody's always doing a story yeah. about it every couple yeah. of months. If you're coming through Nevada, Look for the Clown Motel. Yeah. And I recommend the Mizpah. Yeah, Mizpah. <laughs> Mizpah is nice. I will tell you, I was uh, going through Tonopah in March, I believe. So this is after the COVID pandemic began. Mm -hmm. And I stopped at the Clown Motel, and I, I went in. And, boy, the guy who was in there was really talkative. We, we talked for probably half an hour. And he showed me all the improvements that were being made and invited us to come up. So... I will extend that invitation to you and give you guys a slideshow. I so. think you can handle that story, yeah. Greg, for, for us. <laughs> you be our I'll, correspondent on the road. I'll find the parking lot. In fact, the one at the Chevron there and sleep in my car in the parking lot <laughs> and sort of all over the, over the mid spa and the, and the Clown Motel. Okay, just to and be just safe. Just in case there's, <laughs> there's anyone out there that's not familiar with the Clown Motel, it's a, it's a drive up motel, like you, you know, the olden days. Um, I'm dating myself. And uh, it is filled with clowns. Paintings of clowns, clown dolls, clown figures, clown you name it. It has clowns everywhere. I know we've probably lost half our audience just talking <laughs> about clowns. Oh, no, Pennywise. But Is Pennywise <laughs> in there anywhere? I don't so know. Let's go there. Yes. But <laughs> clowns everywhere. Okay, so moving on. Most read story on mysterywire.com. According to our data, uh, disappearances draw attention to Nevada Triangle mystery. Now, this is something coming in from the outside, I had never heard of. Um, but uh, this has drawn a huge amount of attention, that there is uh, sort of the Bermuda Triangle of the Mojave Desert out here. Um, one of you guys, pick, me, pick it up here. Where, what, what are we talking about? The triangle covers where? Which, which cities? And I it's know, but between Las Vegas, 
Reno, Reno and Bakersfield. And Bakersfield. So right there, draw a triangle there, and that's where planes just fall out of the sky. Missy, uh, uh, there, there's been some famous ones recently, too, certainly, uh, that, that... Steve Fawcett. Steve Fawcett, that's who I was thinking right. of, yes. That, so so it, this is not uh, just a one-off, two-off, three. It's, it's happening. Something's happening. I think what caught on with, the, with this story for our readers and viewers was Dave Politis. We've, uh, you know, I've interviewed Dave... Uh, maybe a dozen times on Coast to Coast uh, about his missing 411 series of books about people who go vanishing in national parks and national forests. And he was able to draw a correlation between his missing persons clusters. Yosemite, for example, is one of the big ones. Um, and, and he's been here, Dave's been here to talk about some missing persons cases, very strange, uh, that happened here in Nevada in our general broadcasting area. Uh, but he noticed a similarity between the missing persons clusters and missing airplanes. And so the Nevada Triangle uh, mystery was sort of bor- uh, born from combining those two databases. And it's, it's pretty weird. I think there are you know, a lot of logical and uh, understandable explanations for a lot of the planes that crash. There's updrafts from the, caused by the Sierra Nevada. Uh, the missing people uh, part of the story is a little harder to explain. Yeah, um, I think we even had one that was up on Mount Charleston, a, a boy yeah. that disappeared yep. uh, for uh, for some reason. He was just gone in the middle of nowhere. And there's even articles that are up at the Mount Charleston Library you can still find and, and read about that. And and Dave Pilates, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, fill in the gaps here, former cop who just started saw, seeing these things happening in some of the national parks and then said, wait a second, he was sort of thrust into... There's a pattern here, and I need to find out what it is. And he did. He didn't. He didn't make it up out of thin air. He observed it and then went forward with it. Yeah, Dave has a, had a career as a law enforcement officer, then went into tech, and he started looking into Bigfoot stories. He had relationships with Native American tribes in uh, California and Oregon, Western tribes, and and would start hearing these Bigfoot stories. And then as he would travel around to national parks chasing down Bigfoot stories, he developed relationships with some National Park Service rangers and employees who told him, hey, a lot of people are disappearing here and it's being covered up. And to this day, he's been unable to get a list of all the missing people in U.S. national parks and forests. Uh, They say they don't have such a list. Uh, A lot of these cases are active. You know, people disappear. It's as if the U.S. Park Service doesn't really want to talk about it. It would be bad for business. So he started researching it. He's identified a couple of dozen missing persons clusters in North America. He's since expanded to urban areas, not just out in the middle of nowhere. And it, the research has looked at other places in the world, but uh, the Nevada Triangle is one of the key places. And he's one of the uh, interviews we were just talking about. We've got full interviews. Uh, we have, uh, I think it's close to an hour of uh, interviews with him on the website. Yeah, and um, one of his most recent ones is about uh, hunters that get lost in the woods. Right. And it's not really getting lost. It's these guys are disappearing the same way. And you think about it, that seems like the kind of person who's pretty prepared to deal with what's out there in the wilderness. And, to, you know, you see some of those stories, and it's pretty amazing how these yeah. guys just up and disappear. Plucked, so, as if harvested hmm. or plucked or something. <laughs> So there's a little overlap now going into the video side of Mystery Wire. The most watched video on our site, watched through mysterywire.com, is the Nevada Triangle story. So let's go to number two. Greg, you had mentioned this, the Needles UFO crash. Uh, We've covered this a couple times in the past year, in fact. A a lot of very interesting characters. Um, A tale of a UFO that's doing things that, for what it's worth, UFOs shouldn't be able to do. Um, including uh, landing and taking off uh, as in the form of a meteor? Well, they, yeah, that's how it was described as something that looked like a meteor came out of the sky. The closer, closest witness was a guy we dubbed Houseboat Bob who described a craft. It looked like uh, XB-47, something like that, mm-hmm. something that came off the range, that was off the reservation in essence and crashed along the side of the Colorado River down near Needles within... Uh, 20 minutes or so, a whole uh, uh, flotilla or phalanx of uh, helicopters, military helicopters, came looking, shining spotlights around, and a really big uh, 
crane helicopter came and picked this thing up and carted it away and headed in the direction of, uh, of Nevada, and perhaps Nellis, Area 51, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, you have to call it a UFO. That doesn't mean an alien spacecraft. This could have been some sort of a classified project that went awry and the military came and scooped it up and took it away. Those kinds of operations have been described in UFO cases, in genuine unknown craft of a maybe a, a more mysterious origin, but uh, yeah, that that we interviewed a number of different witnesses and um, put together a pretty compelling story. Some of those witnesses have since died, and then Matt and I went looking for the men in black. I think we've talked about it on this podcast before about we would drive down to Needles trying to find these strange vehicles on the side of the road that people kept reporting seeing, and then one day we found them. They found you, they I, found if, if my yeah. memory serves me well. The, uh, is it, what the was mysteriously <laughs> named OST, at least at the time. Secu- Office of Secure Transportation. If right. I, and I'd never heard of, I'd never heard of this govern government organization before. Had you guys heard of it before no. they stopped? Matt, how did that? Go? Did they stop you on the roadway? No. Uh, or, uh, we how did that go? Kind of stopped them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we saw them go in the opposite direction, and I was like, George, I. Th- I think that's them. <laughs> okay, they're they're driving a what? Like a big black they're suburban driving, or something? Uh, or? Some strange looking RVs, some pickups that seem to have different sort of antennas on top of them. Not your standard like you know trucker CB antennas, but like actual covered antennas that that were, had some sort of rotating dishes inside of them. Um, the 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 back ends of them did not look like your typical camper shell. It looked very armored. And then uh, these big RVs, and then a was there a semi truck with them? Yeah, when we but saw it kept them? going. Yeah, yeah. So we spun around. I went past them, you know, just barely over the speed limit, and then <laughs> turned and hopped out so we could get a shot of them driving by. And instead of driving by, they surrounded us <laughs> and got out of their car, looking very menacing. And we we argued with them for about two seconds, and then realized that they were probably not the people you yeah, want to argue with. You guys were able to, to to talk them off the cliff, talk them down a little bit, right? Yes. So no they, bribes involved. They but. jump out of their civilian clothes, but you can see the guy, the, the one guy that we interacted with was packing underneath of his his uh, I think it was Hawaiian kind of a shirt, mm-hmm. and uh, they demanded to see ID and. We put up a brave front and said, "Will you show us your ID?" And then they did. And then, so, <laughs> and this is all the conversation camera. changed. Yes. You're, 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 you can see this on the website. You're rolling on this. Rolling on you're all rolling. of okay. it. Yeah. Maybe yeah. shaking a little bit at this time. <laughs> they indicated that they worked. At, they were coming from the Nevada test site, what used to be called the Nevada test site. And hey, we've got a lot of friends who work for the Department of Energy. We love the test site. We met out there a lot, and it calmed things down a little bit. I gave him our business card and said, we'd really like to talk about who you guys are and what you work for. And um, and we got it. The, the head of the what this agency we'd never heard of before, the OST, Office of Secure Transportation, called us from Washington. We had a great conversation. They had never had any media coverage. And we talked our way into it. And so the head of the agency came out. We went up to the Nevada test site, Area 12, I think, where they'd been undergoing training exercises. And this is the agency that's in charge of moving nuclear weapons from Mm -hmm. place to place, base to base, and nuclear materials. And they, we learned so much about how they operate. This is the cream of the crop, badasses, uh, who who you would think you would have assigned to this kind of a job. And as tough as those guys are, their vehicles uh, are even tougher. We learned that they have these giant transport trucks that are capable of defending themselves. That if, for example, they somehow all the the armed guards or you know security personnel were taken out that the truck could could defend itself. Mm-hmm. We didn't learn all the secrets of that, but yeah, they didn't tell us all the all the ways it protects itself. But they did deny that they were involved in the uh, UFO crash in Needles. They said they were not a part of that. So maybe there's you know other models of their vehicles being used by other agencies, which wouldn't surprise me. But they said no. They were not there, and they have a pretty serious job. I don't think they'd be on a quick response team for something <laughs> yeah. like that. And they told us that they did not have any uh, – they weren't carrying a nuclear weapon at the time that we had the encounter. A friend of mine from the Department of Energy had called and said, what the hell were you guys doing? And then told us that if they had been carrying a nuclear weapon, that our outcome might have been very different that day. <laughs> so so well, it was a great story. We got to look. Made, made it through that little encounter. It was very impressive. Those guys are very impressive. And Their they're still is, around. They're still, the office yeah. is still there. In fact, we just saw an article 
uh, or a news release uh, a couple weeks ago. They're in the process of releasing a new truck uh, that's even more fortified and secretive and who knows what. Um, moving on. Going to keep it with video. This was surprising to me, but I, but I see the intrigue here. Because thinking Mystery Wire again, UFOs, we're just talking about that, secret government stuff. Most watched on YouTube. We've got our own YouTube channel. We have hundreds of videos there now. Um, really good that anyone from around the world can get onto our YouTube. It's just Mystery Wire on YouTube and watch us. Most watched video. Actually, let's start with number three. I'll just work back. Third most watched video on YouTube is the Best Evidence series from 1989. There are two Best Evidence, uh, UFO Best Evidence series, one from 1989, the other 1990. 1990. Uh, we have both of those on there, hours of content on there. Second most viewed video is uh, from 2002, an unedited interview, George, you did with uh, Frank Collada, former mobster. And then the number one video by leaps and bounds, by millions of page views, uh, what we dubbed the real life Irishman. And this is a Jimmy Hoffa story. So the top two videos on YouTube are mob related, which uh, we're gonna talk about here in a little, more in a little bit, but uh, the real life Irishman, a uh, local guy here for us in Las Vegas, correct? No, he was not from here, but the um, Jimmy Hoffa was the local guy. I mean, it, right, right. Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters built the Las Vegas Strip. There was mob money, I mean, uh, organized crime Teamster money, and slash Teamster money in pretty much every hotel on the Strip. Hoffa was a major figure in the development of modern Las Vegas, so his murder was certainly of interest here as much as anywhere. And the, um, you know, his disappearance has always been discussed in, in, uh, in top-level circles here as elsewhere. Some of the prosecutors who were federal prosecutors at the time later came to Las Vegas. So the, uh, we did an interview with uh, Charles Brandt, who had written this book, I Heard You Paint Houses, about uh, Frank Sheeran. Frank Sheeran had been close to Jimmy Hoffa, had been a bodyguard to Jimmy Hoffa, became the president of a local Teamsters union. He was a hitman. He did jobs. He took out took out the trash for Hoffa and the Teamsters, as well as for Russell Buffalino, head of the uh, crime family in, in uh, northern uh, New York. And um, so when his story was, a deathbed confession, was that he is the guy that lured Hoffa to this location, went there as his security, and then took him out. And that Hoffa had been, uh, the remains had been taken to a crematorium not far from the location where he was killed, and he was taken out. Now, you'll remember... The Irishman, this movie, this Martin Scorsese film comes out on Netflix, mm -hmm. and it was hugely popular. And that was right at the beginning of the COVID time when people are all locked down. They needed something to look at. Three hours. And Kick then back. we and then we <laughs> yeah. came along with the series we had done about Frank Shear and the Irishman, and including some of the video of his deathbed confession. And people just jumped all over it. I yeah. think it's a good example of like a lot of the stuff. I mean, you name those top three stories, and the amount of people that saw them during their original broadcast. I mean, best evidence that was one of the highest rated series that Channel 8's ever done, but think about, you know, Las Vegas in 1989. Doesn't take a lot of viewers mm -hmm. to be the highest rated, you know, <laughs> series ever aired. So, you know, all the Mystery Wire just is able to breathe life back into these things and get them out to people that, you know, weren't viewers at the time, maybe missed them. You can't watch all the channels at once. And a lot of them, like the Hoffa um, series, that's a, a real gem that got a whole lot more viewers mm -hmm. now than it did when it first aired. And, and the number two there, Frank Collada, he's the local guy I was thinking of. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he just passed away the past few months, sadly. Um, he was a well-known uh, associate um, and uh, lived here in Las Vegas, uh, had, uh, uh, to put it simply, testified against his own people, against the mob, and then lived out his life here in Vegas. He was kind of a man about town. He even gave tours to people and showed them where he committed crimes, which is just amazing. <laughs> uh, but you had a chance to talk to him a couple times. Yeah, so I had covered it back in the days when the Hole in the Wall gang was busted uh, doing a, a robbery uh, at Bertha's, and uh, then Collada flipped, became a witness. He was convinced by the feds that the Tony Spilatro, his boss, was going to have him whacked, so he turned, and he helped put away a lot of mobsters, not only here, but uh, in Chicago and across the Midwest, 
And then he went into witness protection and he was out in that for a number of years. And we got the first interview with him when he was just emerging from witness protection, did some series and, and I stayed in touch with him for years. It's, you know, in a way it's kind of outrageous that uh, he enjoyed life as sort of a semi-celebrity. He was in the movie Casino, which is about to celebrate its anniversary. He portrayed years. himself. Uh, he killed a guy that he had really had killed in real life yeah. uh, in the movie. And, you know, I can see the members of that guy's family, Sherwin Jerry Listener, I think his name was, and not being happy about about uh, Collada's role in the, in the film and re reenacting something like that. But I, I can't imagine that there's a, another case of um, that happening in Hollywood history. Did you cover the mob guys? Did you cover Collada back in those days? Well, you know, my first memory of that was as i said when i came to town ned day had just died and the rj had put out a double truck of mob hangouts in las vegas and, and ned day let's go through who ned who ned yeah. day you mentioned his name a couple of times and i and I, as i'm here at channel eight i smile and go this is where this i walk in the halls of and i mean that seriously i'm walking the halls that ned day walked because i had tremendous reverence for him and knew him as from a distance but not as close, certainly, as George was. But, okay, so sorry for interrupting you, but Ned Day was a, was a um, the mob reporter for years and years here in town that, you know, George then grabbed the mantle from him after he died mysteriously in Hawaii. And I'll say that because I talked to the guy that rescued him on the beach about a month later, and he said he was trying to say something to me. I don't know what he was saying, but he was alive when I pulled him out of the water. Hanama Bay. Uh, he was there and, wow. and pulled him out of the water. And, and I, I made a point to said I have a friend here that died about a month ago here. Uh, and it just coincidentally was taking a trip there. And he, yeah, I took him, I pulled him out of the water. The guy from Vegas? Um, and, he, and he couldn't understand what he was saying. I so much would have loved to have heard what, what Ned would wanted to say. But sorry for interrupting you, but go ahead. So longtime re mob reporter here in Vegas. Yeah, well, not me. I was, I was an editor. But uh, people who I respected a great deal and... Uh, from Alan Tobin to John L. Smith. Uh, these, these were the guys on the print side who were telling the story. And I got to know Ned Day maybe a little better through what I learned from George's interviews uh, when you talked about how he was your buddy and, and you guys worked together and uh, a bit of a mentor to you. And I learned more about him through that than, than I did anything when I first came to town. We have a lot of Ned stuff, by the way, that I've compiled that we have. I'm going to put a little tease out there, okay? A lot of Ned stuff that I, we have not put up yet, that while I'm compiling all the stuff for Mystery Wire, um, I, I save some of that stuff, too. And it's, it's fascinating, um, as you know. Well, we produced a series after Ned died, uh, September 3rd, 1987, Hawaii. And, uh, and then I, sp we sp I spent the next couple of months traveling back to his home town in Milwaukee and some of his haunts and interviewed family members and people he had lived with and it filled in a lot of uh, the picture that I did not know him being married to Miss Nude International for a time and then working for the Balistrieri family um, you know getting to know the the wise guys from both sides and then his blossoming journalism career with a guy named Charlie Sykes and if you watch uh, uh, cable news Charlie Sykes has become sort of a, a he, he's basically a conservative guy who's become um, uh, a critic of conservatives and, and is very prominent on the airwaves these days, but Charlie shared a lot of stories about Ned. Ned was instrumental in getting me here. He and, and Bob Stodall uh, were, had hired me and, and took me under their wing. And uh, yeah, he, we became good friends and what a character he was. He was like a, a caricature of himself, if that's possible. I mean, um, he was not only the best mob reporter, but probably the best reporter period on so many su subjects. He had as many uh, political contacts as, say, John Ralston does now, as many mob contacts as John, uh, you know, as John L. Smith did, had back then, uh, would write the same kind of uh, colorful stories that I do on television. He was, uh, he was better than all three of us combined. He was just one of a kind character. We should put that series, it's a five part series on Life of Ned, on, on our Mystery Wire site one of these days. And uh, to kind of break some news on here, that's something that we will be doing is uh, we're going to be doing a little more focusing on the mob. Uh, definitely here we're based in Las Vegas, of course, and if, if you've been living under a rock, Las Vegas has a little bit of a history with the mob. Uh, Ned Day covered most of that, uh, that history. In fact, uh, online you can find this, and, and we'll definitely be putting this on Mystery Wire 2 as the documentary 
uh, that he put together, Mob on the Run, um, tells you everything you need to know about, about Ned Day <laughs> and the mob in Vegas. Uh, just an excellent documentary. We did an updated version in 1995. Ned and Bob Stodall put together Mob on the Run in, I think, 86, after Tony Spilandro had died. And then um, and then we did an update in 1995. And, of course, we've done other stories. But we have hundreds of hours of mob-related stuff, interviews with Lefty Rosenthal that only aired once on television. Uh, we did a whole series, Matt and I, with Joe Yablonski, the FBI uh, ch- special agent in charge here in Las Vegas during the years when the, the mob uh, really was taken down. And I think we're going to, in the year to come, we're going to be putting a lot more mob-type stuff on there, true crime stories, true crime mysteries, mm-hmm. unsolved murders, things of that sort, sort of uh, broaden the base of what we cover on Mystery Wire. And if you watch Mob on the Run, you'll see almost shot for shot, identical shots in the video that are also in the movie Casino. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think they... Uh, I think they probably printed out a transcript of Mob on the Run and then whittled it down to make the movie. Oh, I can tell you for sure that's not an accident because I handed over uh, videos that we had done, taken from our airwaves to uh, to Nick Pelleggi and uh, the people who were working with him in a couple of meetings that we had. Um, they didn't credit us for that uh, in the book or the movie, but, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. And a, mo- it, it, a movie scene was even shot here at, uh, yeah, yeah. in the Howard Hughes house behind right. the Channel 8 Studios. It gives, I, just, I, I mentioned the Howard Hughes house just in passing and go, oh, wait a second. On our lot here is a house that was once the residence of Howard Hughes and was used for part of the movie. But yeah, just about 100 yards from where we're sitting right now doing this. I'm, I'm going to give a little reset, especially for those listening on the podcast right now, of who everybody is here. We've got Greg Haas, who was the original writer-producer with Mystery Wire. Duncan Phoenix, who now is producer and writer with, with Mystery Wire. Matt Adams, photojournalist, chief photographer at 8 News Now, but a photojournalist for a lot of George's stuff that he did with Mystery Wire. And, of course, George Knapp, the, 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 king, the king of all Mystery Wire and, and beyond and who knows where else. And I'm Ron Futrell. So with that, Duncan, we'll uh, throw it back to you. you got some more, some more yeah, milestones. So, and we're meeting like this to, to really talk about Mystery Wire being one year old. Happy birthday again to Mystery Wire. Um, but not only has the, the, the Mystery Wire site, the brand, developed over the year, a lot has changed in this past year. Uh, we've had multiple national UFO stories, uh, talk of uh, the government funding a, a new uh, task force, the UAP task force, um, a lot of coverage of Skinwalker Ranch from what George has done in the past, what we're doing currently, and, and a History Channel show that's out there. Um, and other stations like in Salt Lake City uh, doing stories on it. A lot has has passed in that year. It has been an interesting year. What we wanted, first of all, with Mystery Wire, and Greg and I had this discussion with you, George, early on, was not just get all this great archival stuff that we've got that we know is there and we just keep finding. And I guarantee you if I start looking, I'll find some more. But we also wanted to make sure it was topical so that it was covering the new, fresh things that are happening that will happen in the future so that it's, it, it has the best of both worlds with that. And I think we've accomplished that. If you look back at those series, the Best Evidence series, and then the stories that came after it, you would see the seeds that were sown back then are sort of bearing fruit now. Many of the people who were major players in the study of UFOs and trying to get to the bottom of these things back then who kept a low profile now, here it is 30 years later, and we're openly talking about their role in it. I mentioned Harry Reid and Bob Bigelow as two examples of that. Uh, you know, and, and the, the themes, the idea of crash or recovered technology, metamaterials uh, built by someone other than us, craft that can do things that we don't do, now out in the open, now openly uh, acknowledged by the Pentagon that this is worthy of study. You know, the things, because of COVID and the election, coverage of UAP, UFO-related stories sort of slowed down the last six months. I think it's going to pick back up again. You know, I, I, I do not uh, share uh, the optimism of some people who write about this, that there's going to be some big revelation, uh, assuming that President Trump goes out uh, of office and, and there's a transition made. Uh, a friend of ours, uh, Bryce Zabel, has written a briefing document for what should be told to Joe Biden. Um, if he uh, assumes the president's here in the couple of couple of months, and um, I'm not sure that that's going to happen. He's got to ha- have a lot on his plate. I do know. I think the people who do the briefing um, are not happy that there's going to be a new Secretary of Defense, even for an interim. They don't want to go through the whole thing and bring uh, this person up to date if it's just going to be for a couple of months. That's my suspicion. Um, 
But I suspect that 2021, once the uh, election news dies down a little bit, and hopefully once COVID gets under control to some degree, if that's possible, that the UFO, UAP type news will rise to the surface again. There's certainly a lot of stuff bubbling just beneath the surface. There's some stories that Matt and I are working on that we, uh, we hope to, to uh, uncork here soon. Documents that we put on the website, uh, things of that sort. So I think 2021 will be a good year. I hope so. Yeah. And uh, uh, going back on my thought that about this past year, you know, not only has it been political, uh, the entertainment side of, of uh, UFO, UAP, paranormal, uh, has has definitely taken off once again. There's a very successful uh, film, The Phenomena, that was put out. We covered that a little few weeks back. Um, and then another one that's uh, being looked at again, uh, that's not uh, directly UFO, maybe paranormal, maybe, you know, you can add probably a few terms to it, The Mothman. Uh, you might remember an, an old Richard Gere movie about The Mothman. That This is not a remake. This is a documentary. Yeah, so the, the Richard Gere movie, The Mothman Prophecies, uh, that was based on the work of a guy, a journalist named John Keel, who was one of the early uh, writers, authors looking into the UFO mystery. He traveled the world um, sort of as a real-life uh, Fox Mulder kind of a guy um, looking into UFOs. Somewhere along the line, John Keel uh, uh, came to the conclusion that UFOs are not ETs. This is something else that he saw that there is a mixture of what you what looks like ET kind of technology and mythology mixed in with paranormal. This is long before Skinwalker Ranch was known to the world, and uh, maybe the the Mothman story sort of epitomizes that. So we're talking about Point Pleasant, West Virginia, 1966 to 67, uh, when residents of this little town, West Virginia, had reporting seeing this giant humanoid figure with wings and red glowing eyes. And actually, the sightings had gone back hundreds of years. The Native American tribes had been in the area, had reported something similar, and the Mothman legend was born. The, the, it peaked when the, a bridge in West Virginia collapsed uh, during a time of heightened uh, sightings of the Mothman, and so the legend began. Was Mothman there as sort of a harbinger of disaster? Did Mothman cause this? Was Mothman sort of a, a death in, uh, in a humanoid form that it, it shows up where bad disasters are about to happen? Uh, at first, you know, a lot of people who had seen this thing didn't want to talk about it. Uh, over the years, they've opened up. John Keel wrote this book about it, uh, The Mothman Prophecies, and it set off a number of other researchers and authors to write about it. And uh, now we have a, a filmmaker named Seth Breedlove, a young filmmaker who cr has carved, carved out his own niche in this field where he produces uh, small town mo monsters is sort of the umbrella term for what he goes after, looking into legends like the Mothman around the country. Uh, I think, in my opinion, I'm not a film critic, but he's done 10 films. I think he's working on his 11th, and each one is a little bit better than the last one. The most recent film is called uh, uh, The Mothman Legacies. And it, it goes to Point Pleasant and re-interviews witnesses, interviews some new people who come forward. As I said, sort of like Roswell, where the, the, the Roswell story, that little town, did not want to embrace it for so long. They didn't like that they were known as the crash flying saucer capital of the world. That was the same for Point Pleasant. Uh, but that's changed. They now have a Mothman statue downtown. They have a Mothman museum. I think until 2020, they had a Mothman uh, festival. So, uh, COVID didn't allow that to happen. But Seth Breedlove put this new film together. We got to look at it, and we interviewed him, and maybe we should play that now. Yeah, here it goes. Small Town Monsters, how many films have you done? Uh, the Mothman Legacy is our 10th, but because of COVID, we were filming the 11th as we were wrapping up the 10th. So we're actually, we've just finished post-production on the 11th. So total films is 11, total uh, mini series. We have three other mini series. So we're at, we're at basically 13 productions, 13, 14 productions now. I think this is your best one of the ones that I've seen. It's really, oh, wow. So uh, tell me about the genesis of the film. I mean, this is right in your wheelhouse, this story. Uh, it's been told before. So what did you set out to do? What did you want to do with it? Yeah, I think when we were making, so we had made a movie that looked at that classic Mothman story back in 2017. And during the press run for that movie, everyone kept asking if we were going to do a sequel. And I had always said no, because 
to me, the story, the Mothman, the Mothman story was what we had just made. It was that 66, 67 flap of sightings. It was the collapse of the Silver Bridge. And, and I didn't see there being much of a story beyond that. Um, but in, in making that movie, releasing that movie, and then, you know, the subsequent three years since it came out, we've met numerous people claiming to be witnesses. Um, and I, so I knew going into this that we had enough people, enough witnesses that we could talk to about sightings and that the sightings ran the gamut of what people were encountering. It wasn't all just like one type of event. Um, however, what really got me interested was when I started learning about the, the Scots-Irish immigrants that came over and sort of settled Appalachia, the Appalachian immigrants, the, the Native American, the First Nations, people that lived in the area, how that how their culture, how their legends maybe play a role in the Mothman story uh, today. Um, and that was what, you know, the, the evolution of storytelling, I guess, is what drew me to the, to, to the movie. Yeah, it's, well, it's great. That's, that's really a great part where you show the melding of legends from these different cultures, the First Nations culture and then the Scotch-Irish uh, uh, immigrants, because there is crossover there. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, I thought, if I can, the thing of it is, when you're making these movies, we've done 11 movies, and at a certain point, you, you, we make so many per year, you're trying to find a hook. I mean, you probably know this better than anyone. You're trying to find a hook that, that might grab your attention as much as the, the reader or the viewer's attention. And this is, that's what got me. You know, my, my dad's family were, um, were from North Carolina. They're from the, the deep Appalachian roots. I mean, in my, in my dad's side of the family. So I felt that, you know, pull when I was coming to this, just that, that look into the history of the area and to deny the similarities between something like a Banshee um, or the Screech Owl stories, you know, and the similarities between those and the Mothman would be disingenuous. And that's really what drew me to it. Um, let's start with the, the central event uh, surrounding the Mothman event. For those who don't know the story, Point Pleasant, 1967, something terrible happens and uh, the Mothman sort of it is plays a central role before and after. Tell that. Tell tell that. Yeah, I mean the the story that draws people to the Mothman is the 1966-1967 wave of sightings. It starts in November of 1966 when two couples are driving outside of the TNT area, uh, just outside of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. They encounter this glowing red-eyed winged humanoid creature standing on the side of the road it chases them in their car it speeds up to 100 miles per hour they race back to town they report the incident to police and then as as it tends to go local media picks up on the story the story hits newspapers across the country and all of a sudden other people come in with similar sightings around the area and we learn about a history that goes back possibly to the 1930s of birdman like creatures around Point Pleasant, West Virginia. But during that 66 wave, you have up to 200 witnesses uh, of the Mothman. And that's going off of what John Keel said. That's how many people he claimed to interview while he was writing his seminal book, The Mothman Prophecies. Um, you've also got a UFO wave that's sweeping across West Virginia. And even though that wave didn't start in 66, it had been going on since the 50s. You've got this, this extensive period of time where people are seeing UFOs, and, and especially during that time period, you've got sort of a peak that happens there. Then you also have the appearance of mysterious men in black around Point Pleasant and, and much of Appalachia in general, sort of coinciding with the Mothman sightings and, and the, uh, the UFOs. And then everything seems to be cascading towards something. We're racing to, towards some sort of an end point. And in 1967, December of 1967, December 15th, to be specific, the silver bridge spanning the Ohio River from Point Pleasant into Gallipolis across the river uh, collapses into the Ohio River uh, during rush hour and 46 people are lives, 46 lives are lost. Um, and that to most people, that's it. That's the end of the Mothman story. Um, but obviously it's not the truth. It's, it's just the most well-known chapter in that story. 
the, the big picture, looking back at it, you know, during the disaster, and you do a great job telling that story, in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, people are dealing with the consequences of all this loss of life, and they're not thinking about Mothman. Later, it occurs to people, maybe Mothman was a harbinger of doom, that he was trying to tell us something was going on. That's the story that's explored in, in Keel's books and in the later movie, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing you have, you always have to mention about Point Pleasant and Gallipolis is they're, they're, they're small towns. Point itself is tiny. So anyone dies in that town, they're more than likely related to someone. So you've got 46 people dying that are connected to everyone. Everyone feels this when it happens. And in some ways, when you talk to people there today, some people that I've spoken to believe that the Mothman may or whether or not it actually had uh, any sort of relation to the bridge collapse people had something they could either blame it on or something they could pay attention to other than the loss of a life so there there became this idea with the release of john keel's book in the 70s that you know the mothman was a harbinger he was there to warn people of oncoming tragedy and death and i think when you watch the movie there's a connection there between the banshee, which is this, you know, being that, that has glowing red eyes that appears before tragedy and death that heralds the oncoming disaster and, and the Mothman who does essentially the same thing, despite looking different from what we connect with a typical banshee. So did, does that come about because of the culture of the region or does it come around because of John Keel's impact on that story with his, release of the, of the Mothman prophecies that those are things that I'm very excited about when, when we get into this story, but there's this history of winged beings that <laughs> herald disaster. Even, even when you get into something like the Thunderbird, the Thunderbird was typically said to precede uh, disasters. You've got the Garuda and, and one of John Keel's early titles for the Mothman prophecies was the year of the Garuda. Um, so there's been a connection between the Mothman and these winged entities going all the way back to when Keel was looking into this, but um, Point Pleasant itself, I mentioned this a, a minute ago, but Point Pleasant itself has a connection to a winged being that supposedly preceded uh, tragedies. You can find it, uh, a, a local professor named James Gay Jones, who was a, at least he was not an accredited folklorist, but he was something of a folklorist, wrote about a being that was talked about um, around Point Pleasant during the 1930s that they referred to as the Birdman. And this was a being that supposedly, you know, preceded barns burning down and floods happening and things like that. So there's a long history of this in that area. And, and people will hear those stories and think, oh, that's quaint. Look at that folklore. Look at the mythology, some of which bleeds over into Native American legends in the area uh, and not take them seriously. But there are so many hundreds of witnesses to one form of this being or another that it really does need to be taken seriously. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and I think that the impact of these stories on our history um you can't you can't demean that it's 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 a big part of west virginia it's a big part of um there's something here there's something with these winged creatures that might speak to our need to understand tragedy and i think that's something that i've i've started to learn in my frequent trips back to point pleasant is today you go into point pleasant and they have uh, historical figures. They, they have these statues of historical figures that line the flood wall. Um, it, but yet in the centerpiece of the town, the, the dead center of the city square, you have the Mothman statue instead of all these historical figures. And there's, there's something going on there, you know, that speaks to a, a bigger human, a human need to understand these tragedies. Uh, your film, uh, of course, touches on two uh, giants in the field of paranormal research, UFO research, Gray Barker and John Keel. Tell our audience who Gray Barker was, what he's known for, and then we'll get into the story of Keel and, and his central role in this tale. Yeah, um, Gray Barker was a West Virginia author, uh, investigator, researcher, and I do not fashion myself in any way a Gray Barker uh, expert. I, I, it, he's one of those guys that fascinates me, but I also understand it's a very con complicated history with Gray Barker. And it's one that I, I need to spend more time on, but, 
uh, one thing you can't, you can't, you know, sort of um, sweep under the rug is he had an impact and a role in some of the biggest uh, ufology cases, cryptid cases, unusual paranormal history around the state of West Virginia that there are, you know, you've got the Grafton monster, you've got his, his role in the Flatwoods monster story from 1952, um, as well as the Mothman. He wrote a, a book um, that actually preceded uh, Keel's book called The Silver Bridge that looked at the, the um, you know, the, the Mothman sightings and the collapse of the Silver Bridge that took place in Point Pleasant. Um, and he was a central figure in the whole story of Men in Black. Right, yeah. When, when Men in Black, you have a journalist that you chronicle in, in your film who had an encounter with him. It's not something made up. Yeah, Mary Heyer was a local reporter for the Athens Messenger, and she, her and Keel were sort of intertwined. They, they spent all this time during 66 and 67 looking into the UFO sightings and the Men in Black and the, the Mothman reports. In 1967 or something, it might have even been after, I can't quite remember, Mary actually was visited by a man in black in her Point Pleasant office. And one of my favorite things to do when I go to Point Pleasant is to to go down there to her office. Her office still sits there. The the sign is still out front and pay homage to her because her role in the Mothman story has kind of been underplayed over the years. Um, I don't know if it's just because she's not a, a paranormal name you know she was simply a, a local reporter but her role in the mothman story is probably greater than keel or barker's in that she did so much to document all the local sightings that happened and i know a lot of people who've spent time looking into the mothman story who, who turned to her um newspaper articles more than they do some of keel's writing or barker she she wrote an art um a newspaper column called where the waters mingle and that turned into this constant stream of ufo sighting reports and mothman activity reports it's, it's really fascinating to go through that stuff it could be a film for you in the future just by herself i mean yeah she was there i mean she's boots on the ground she knows the locals people would talk to her and tell her stories that maybe they would not tell to john keel an outsider who came in yeah i think she, her her role in in the end, Keel leaves. So Keel leaves in '67 and doesn't really come back. He doesn't journey back to Point Pleasant at any point until the movie comes out in 2002. So during this time period from 1967 until the very early 1970s when she passed away, it was just Mary Heyer that was capturing all this. And there there were people in town that would turn to her who wouldn't tell a thing to, to John Keel or Gray Barker, but she's a local, she lives in town. She's someone who they can trust. And because of that, she becomes a, almost like a clearing house for, for UFO reports around Point Pleasant. Uh, talk a little bit about John Keel. Again, for our uh, listeners who are not familiar with him, he is a giant in this field. I mean, he was a world traveler. He was absolutely courageous. He pursued strange stories all over the planet had some experiences of his own that were very disturbing and became interwoven into the events surrounding Mothman. And it's still underway. He's still a central part of the story. Yeah, I think I think Keel plays the, the biggest role historically in the Mothman story, um, despite the fact that that Heyer and Barker both have their own roles to play. Keel becomes woven into the into the fabric of that story into what we know of as the mothman story um he journeys to point pleasant in 1966 he's as far as i understand it he was actually on a on an assignment from playboy magazine to write an article about about ufos at the time comes to point pleasant and ends up doing this story about the mothman that's seen around town and the ufo activity taking place and you know he he never at a certain point he started trying to distance himself he puts out this book the mothman prophecies and uh, i think it's 1975 that he releases that book I can't, I can't automatically draw that to my memory but he puts out the mothman prophecies book and for a while he tried to keep his distance from the mothman story um i think you know, it's interesting with Keel, you can't tell if it's it's just he has other stuff he wants to do, other stories he wants to tell, other things he wants to investigate, or if he 
was at a point in his life where he didn't think he would ever come up with the answers for any of it. And so he just was done. Like he was moving on. He had said everything he had to say about the Mothman. Um, but in 2002, uh, they put out this movie, the Richard Gere movie. And I think in a way it salvaged the whole thing for him. You know, like all of a sudden people had a great appreciation for the work he had done, which had become overlooked by that point in time. I, as, as far as I understand it, he, his work had kind of, his work went in the, into the Mothman case had become, you know, just a, something that was swept under the rug in a way. Um, so he returned to Point Pleasant and, and was treated almost as a celebrity around town at that point in time. And um, he died, he died in the, in the early 2000s, but uh, I don't think he ever escaped the, the Mothman. It was always looming over him. Well, it messed with him. I mean, he got phone calls that were pretty creepy. I, I think, you know, Keel scholars would say this thing, he was fearless. But this really did mess with him, and um, and he realized he had tapped into something that was really strange. Yeah, I, the book the book really gets into all of that. I mean, there's a reason it's called. We forget. I think in a weird way, we almost forget the reason why it's called the Mothman Prophecies, and that's that he's getting these phone calls that are sort of prophesying oncoming disaster, oncoming tragedies, um, and it's it's one of those things where he becomes extremely paranoid. He's ta he talked about it later in life. He became paranoid as to what might be going on. Um, he, he had other investigators messing with him too around this time, including G Gray Barker. So he's, he's dealing with everything connected to this Mothman case. And then he's dealing with other people, almost hoaxing him and messing with him on the phone. Um, and, and then, you know, like he's also, I, I get the impression that Keel genuinely wanted to understand what was happening. And he formulated theories and hypotheses on what might be happening. Um, and in a way he was doing that simply to satisfy the people who would constantly ask him what he thought was happening. But you have to believe that at some point he wanted to know, like he had a, he, he had a desire to understand what was taking place in Point Pleasant. And he tried to tie everything together in a way with that ultra terrestrial theory. And that was his, um, in our movie, Richard Haddam does such a great job of explaining that theory, but it's, you know, it, it goes a little beyond just like an interdimensional portal concept. We've heard that before. This, this is a little deeper than that. And I think I've always got the impression that's him trying to make heads or tails of what was happening. Well, you know, the problem with the movie, I mean, it was a good movie. I liked it. It wasn't a big hit, as you note in your film. I, I, the problem with it is there is no real nice, neat story arc. You can't just tie it up in a bow and, okay, that's the answer to Mothman uh, because we don't have answers. We still don't have answers. It reminds me of Skinwalker Ranch in the sense that there's no one-size-fits-all explanation for what goes on there. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's funny, in doing these the press for this film, the question you get asked the most is, do you believe in Mothman? And I have to say, I don't, what are we talking about? Like, which Mothman are we talking about? Because the, the sightings, the encounters from 66 up to present day, they, they run the gamut of what people are seeing. You know, the, the physical descriptions of the Mothman that people give aren't all aligned. It's not all the same thing. And I think we're probably dealing with multiple explanations for what is going on. End of the day, I do believe that there is a paranormal or supernatural aspect to the Mothman story and, and the Mothman as a creature. I think there's something going on there beyond just sandhill cranes and giant owls and, and all of those things you hear so often. But I do think those all play a role. And together, you've got something much bigger than we can, than something that we can simply, like you said, tie together with a bow and say, well, here you go. Here's the Mothman. This is what it is. Um, I thought, you know, the film is beautifully shot, really conveys a sense of that that special place in App Appalachia there and, and the scenery and the rivers. And uh, but the most powerful part for me are the, the witnesses, the interview, you know, this this people you interview who are in the town who tried to collect information. The guy at the museum, people who were actual witnesses to see Mothman when they were younger. That that's really powerful for me. And and you get the sense that. Um, you know, people there, they're, they, it's waxed and waned interest in the topic. For a lot of people, they don't want to talk about it. it. It stems back to a tragedy that was painful to resurrect. And others who are not quite sure, 
did Mothman cause this disaster or was he warning us about it or what? And that's still unresolved as well, right? Yeah. And I, I think, I think people there are wrestling with em- even embracing the Mothman as a, as a cultural figure of the town, but as certainly witnesses, witnesses are, it's, it, we were just talking about this yesterday. And, and I think what it is, is I, I was actually talking about it with Richard Haddam yesterday. <laughs> and so what, what I, what I told him and kind of what we agreed on is there's almost a, uh, I hate to use the term because it's almost a PTSD for some of these witnesses where for the, for the remainder of their lives, they're wrestling with what they've seen, whether or not it was real, whether or not they should ever discuss this. And, and then they have the fact that now Mothman's sort of a kitschy pop figure around, around West Virginia, you know? So there's this, it's not a, it's not an easy thing for a witness to, to talk about. Um, We had, one of the most interesting aspects of the movie to me is the way in which some of the witnesses are so matter of fact about their sightings that it's almost like they're recounting what they had for dinner the night before. And I've heard that I've heard that from other people that as a negative, you know, like, well, the film, this, this witness is so boring. And to me, there's something very believable about a witness who has lived with this event for so long that when they tell you about it, it's just like walking across the street the day before or whatever, you know, it's just, just a piece of their story. It's a piece of their life. Um, uh, Where, where do people see this movie? And um, I mean, it's, it's perfect for Halloween. It's perfect for any time. I want to encourage people to watch it because it's really good. Where do they see it? How do they get it? And what's next for you? Uh, it's on all major VOD platforms. So iTunes and Amazon and Google Play and all that kind of stuff. Um, all the basically anywhere you stream or rent purchase movies. Uh, and then DVD and Blu-ray at smalltownmonsters.com. Um, next for me, we actually leave on Monday of next week. We're going back to West Virginia. We're making a movie called On the Trail of UFOs, Dark Sky. Um, with my friend Shannon Legro, So we're working on that next. And then beyond that, we've got On the Trail of Bigfoot, The Journey. And then we have a, another sort of similar to, to Mothman movie coming out next summer called Howl of the Rougarou. So we're, we've got a busy 2021 coming up and a, and a busy remainder of this year as well. I, I thought it was a cool in the sense that you share uh, with your audience the, the idea that um, Mount Pleasant or Point Pleasant has come sort of full circle on Mothman. They've sort of embraced it. I don't know if that's true for everybody in town, but the statue, the museum, uh, I don't know if they have a festival, a Mothman festival. Yeah. I mean, it, it, they do. They have a, a festival that draws over 15,000 people each year. It's the biggest, it's the second biggest event in the state as far as a tourist draw. I mean, I was just in Point Pleasant two weeks ago and and you know, I got to talk to Jeff Wamsley, and he told me they're they're going through what is their biggest attendance here at the museum in its history. So while we were there in the middle of COVID nineteen, there's a steady stream of people going into this place and walking up and down the streets of of Point Pleasant. And and I I've said this before, and I know there would there'd be residents of Point Pleasant who would bristle at this, but the Mothman rescued that town from economic collapse. Because if, if you're aware of any town in the Ohio Valley, any small town in the Ohio Valley, probably any small town almost anywhere right now, they're all struggling. So when you, you can have something that will draw people in like that, um, the, the value of the Mothman goes far beyond just a, a culture, you know, cultural thing or a folklore thing. Uh, in, in Point Pleasant, it's become a, 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 an ep- economic boon that, that was desperately needed. Well, that's awesome. Uh, Seth, great talk to you. Best of luck with the film. It's terrific. I encourage people to see it. And we'll put some links on uh, our website to the museum and to your film. And uh, hope we'll talk again soon. Yeah, thanks so much. So there was a lot of stuff that we wanted to cover with Seth. We didn't want to make it too long. I probably will have him come back sometime and talk about uh, not only this project, but other things that he's working on. He's uh, he's a talented young guy. Uh, as I said, I think each of his films is better than the last one. And um, and uh, I, there's a lot of stuff we'd still like to cover with this, but it, it, that film is available on pretty much all 
streaming networks, I think, and um, mm -hmm. I hope people check it out. All right. No, it is, and look back on, on Mystery Wire and everything it was, what, one of the, to me, one of the, I'll call it one of the great moments, when it, and you handed me a bunch of tapes, old tapes I think probably had dust on them and hadn't been viewed since they originally were recorded, many of them. And I've gone through DVDs, I've gone through old beta tapes, I've gone through VHS tapes, three-quarter inch tapes, large ones, small ones. And then I was going through the uh, ones that you said, yeah, these, these were uh, stuff that we did. I, and I remember when you and Paula Francis were doing the uh, news case, you had f 5 o'clock and you would have a live guest on. And I remember going through them and finding the Bob, the original Bob Lazar interview and the excitement that I had at that moment, like I'd found patient zero. <laughs> like, like, no, it's, it's really what it felt like to me, and I think I use that phrase. I found the first interview with Bob Lazar that was on TV, and I know you've talked about it before, but I think it's worthy of being discussed again briefly on, on what that was like that night, that interview that you did live with Bob Lazar, some of the, and it was 30, a little more than 30 years ago now, that sort of spawned all, that did spawn all this, I think, with you. I don't want to speak for you, but I think it did sort of spawn this with you, and it was a live interview. It was totally organ organic, not something that you went out and pursued. I mean, you did eventually, but something that was sort of you were thrust into with that first Bob Lazar interview. Yeah, I had never done a UFO-related story. I had done two interviews, three interviews, with a guy named John Lear, who we've talked about on this program before. Bill Lear, his father, developed the Lear Jet and the ATAC track tape. And Lear had developed this hypothesis that he tried to sell to Ned Day. It didn't, Ned wasn't buying it. So I put him on the air on a program we produced back then called On the Record, a little 30-minute public affairs show that airs at 6 o'clock in the morning on a weekend, and usually it's a city councilman or a county commissioner, and the audience was not huge, I'll put it that way. Um, so we put Lear on and let him go. And I had no idea what the heck, whether this was credible or not, but it certainly did interest the public in a way that was really surprising to me. We had him on again in 1988, a third time at the end of 88, when he hinted that he knew this guy that was getting, that had just been hired to work out there in the desert. Thought it was Area 51, turns out to be a place called S4. The guy he was talking about was Bob Lazar, but we didn't know his name. And then in May of 1989, Paul and I are doing the five o'clock news. We have a five minute interview segment, live interview segment every day with a newsmaker, interesting person, celebrity, and our, our, uh, our guest bailed on us in the afternoon. We're scrambling to come up with somebody to fill that hole, and um, I called Lear just on a whim, not knowing who Bob Lazar was or what was going on in his life. Uh, it just so happened that all lined up, and we sent Frank Otto up to the, with a live unit to John Lear's house. We blocked out Lazar's face, and out comes spilling this amazing story about him working at a secret facility that was built near the side of the mountain south of Groom Lake, south of uh, Area 51 proper, that he had seen these flying saucers, and they were built by somebody else, that we were reverse engineering them to figure out how they worked, and he'd read all these briefing documents, and man, it was just stunning. And so my life changed, the, the trajectory of this TV station changed, the, um, you know, the phones start ringing like crazy, the news director runs in, pulls me in into the, his office, the general manager comes in, what the hell was that? Is that for real? Is that true? So, well, I guess we better find out. And so it's been uh, 30 plus years that we're still trying to find out. And you can see that original interview, it's on Mystery Wire. Okay, so right. we've got it. And that's one of the nice things about it is that we have raw, uncut stuff. We have finely produced stuff. And it's, it, it, it is what it is. Just go there and love the internet for what it can do there to compile all that stuff finally and let people look at it and decide. Yeah, we have a ton of archival interviews that we have not posted yet. I mean, many of them with people who are no longer around. Many of them with people who are far more prominent than they were back then. Uh, you can see clips of them in the Best Evidence series, the two series, but there's a lot of that stuff that we're gonna be posting this coming year. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'm still finding. I'll find a box of tape somewhere stashed in, in my office or other little uh, cubby holes that I have around the station and around my house. and. Uh, and so the collection will continue to grow. Well, and I'll, and I'll see this now. And, and every once in a while, I'll see Jonathan Turley on TV now, like right here, right now, talking election and politics and different things like that. And I'll see him on TV. And I'll smile and go back and look at the interviews that you did with him years ago. Now we're talking 25, 20 years ago, maybe more, yeah, on Area 51 the and some of the, the cases that he took of some of the people that were victims of 
government neglect there and, and prob- that ended up dying out there because of some of the harmful chemicals that they were using. He was representing them. So it ties into a lot of people that are still out there right now, alive mm-hmm. and kicking, doing things. Well, it's a lesson too. about excessive secrecy. It's what Turley would say back then. You know, it was this, what we had been banging our heads up against for a long time dealing with Area 51 is when you have a place that officially doesn't exist uh, where the environmental laws and, and uh, worker protections don't apply, you have a place like that, then you, you could, should expect that things go awry sometimes and that they try to keep it secret. KLAS went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court on that case, on the side of the workers, to try to force the release of information so they knew what they were exposed to, these gigantic clouds of toxic fumes and smoke that they inhaled out there at the, uh, the base. Uh, some of them did die. A lot of them got sick. They lost. They lost the case. But as we fought alongside with Turley, uh, they, there were some uh, protections built in, although most of the secrets are still being kept. I don't think we put any of those stories up yet. And I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, but but just to, uh, sort of sort of a tease. No, yeah, seriously, for coming. some of the stuff that we've got there. That just is piles and piles of stuff that, yeah, I mean, there aren't enough hours in the day, seriously, to, to get them all out there, but that more is to come. Uh, Matt and I have an Area 51 related story coming this month, by the way. It's not exactly on the level with Jonathan Turley. It's a pretty interesting little side story to what goes on out there, strange stuff in the desert. So keep tuned. All right. So, well, thanks for listening, everybody. Appreciate you taking the time, watching it. Uh, let people know about Mystery Wire. Uh, subscribe to the podcast because we, we're going to be doing more podcasts. We'll have more information. You get behind the scenes stuff that you will hear nowhere else. But so, please do that. Subscribe. This is giving away. We're all fine podcasts are giving away for free. That's what we do here. <laughs> and and then you can also go let people know about Mystery Wire. Sign up for our Facebook page or our YouTube page so you can have the videos and to the website to be able to find out. Um, some final thoughts? Anybody have anything they want to throw out there? Duncan, I'm pointing to you sort of and go... Uh, we've, yes. uh, we've got a, a big collection. Uh, as, uh, in case you weren't watching, if you're just listening uh, earlier in this podcast, I, I dropped the archive folders in front of Ron. Uh, it's about oh. a foot <laughs> tall. You uh, Weighs maybe, what, 10 pounds or so? We've, we've got a lot of content still to go. And that's, and that's content that was already produced. And then we've, on top of everything... We've got the original content that is still being produced. And uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, as we get into next year uh, and uh, the, the COVID situation calms down some, uh, hopefully we'll start getting out and really start uh, going after some of these mysteries in person that are out there right now. All right. For Greg Haas, for Duncan Phoenix, for Matt Adams, for George Knapp, I'm Ron Futrell. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye for now. MysteryWire.com, home of the unusual and unknown. From Area 51 to the paranormal, it's your source to the most vetted UFO stories and special investigations in the world. Take a journey into the universe of MysteryWire.com.